What's cooking guys, it's the Saluki from the city of Haifa. Now I've decided to start a weekly Q&A on my Patreon. Everybody that's donating to my Patreon can write me questions and I'll respond weekly to five or 10 of them. But there are three questions which I always get asked and one of them is how do I speak all these languages? So I'm gonna walk you through how I learn these languages that I speak by fluency English, Hebrew, Spanish, Portuguese and Russian, I'd say same level, Arabic, I understand French and Italian, but I wouldn't say I'm fluent. And for me, saying that I speak a language means that I can make videos in a language. Now I'll let you in on a secret. You don't really have to be fluent in a language in order to interview people in it. You can just think of the questions, write them down, and then later figure out what they were saying. When I was filming on the border of Colombia and Venezuela, then I hardly understood what they were saying. I just kept asking them questions and I was feeling the vibe, okay? So the language I speak best is English. I have a bit of an eclectic accent because I've lived in different English-speaking countries. I lived half a year in Newcastle, England, and I li lived five years in South Africa. When I was five years old, my dad went to work in post-apartheid South Africa as a physiotherapist, and he took the entire family. So English kind of became my native language because these were very influential years, age five to 10. And also I was reading books back then in English, and I still read books in English and I don't read books in Hebrew because most of the books that I'd like to read are written originally in English anyway. So English is the language that I speak best. Now Hebrew I would say is my second language because from age zero to five, I was speaking only Hebrew with my family. But when I came to South Africa, then I kind of forgot it. I remember coming back at age 10 to Israel and uh, not really knowing Hebrew, but I, I learned in about, in a couple of weeks, they were giving me private lessons in school. It was probably a lot easier to pick it up because I had spoken it until age five. And uh, yeah, that's why I have a bit of a weird accent sometimes in Hebrew. And uh, I speak it fluently, obviously. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of great TV shows, rap music, films in Hebrew. It's funny that nobody here in Israel actually speaks correct Hebrew. And if you speak 100% correct Hebrew, then people will think that you're weird or that you're some kind of posh Ashkenazi Jew but it is what it is and uh, it doesn't really bother me in my daily life. So the third language that I speak is Spanish. The way that I learned it is during COVID, I switched from watching anime in Japanese to putting the dub in Spanish. And uh, I know it's kind of cringe, but that's how I learned pretty quick basic Spanish. I have to give credit to Cancerbero for my Spanish because he's my favorite rapper in the world. No se muere quien se va. Solo se muere quien se olvida. Hace mucho, mucho tiempo en un sitio muy remoto. And then I went to Colombia speaking basic Spanish. Es que esta buena idea um, preguntar gentes vendes o no. And I found myself surrounded by Colombians, some of the nicest people in the world. I was kind of adopted by this girl called Natalie. I made a video with her in Colombia. She's a legend. You should watch it. It's about her life story growing up in the hood and making it out. You realize that's not the real life on it. Before you started, but she took me to meet all of her family and I just estaba rodeado de colombianos. Así que I learned very quickly. I can't say that my Spanish is native level because I've tried reading in Spanish. I mean, I do read in Spanish. Jorge Luis Borges, one of my favorite authors from Argentina, a bloody legend. He's a genius in my opinion. And I can't say that I understand 100% on the spot when I'm reading a book in Spanish, unlike English. So I would like one day to get, to be able to speak Spanish like somebody that was born in Argentina, but I can uh, pretty much talk about any topic in Spanish. And I love speaking the language. It's a beautiful language. Ever since I left Latin America, after having lived three months in Colombia, two months in Brazil and half a year in Argentina, then I found myself just by speaking Spanish, making friends in every country in the world. You speak Spanish, boom, you, you've got like an instant friend. Here's a clip of me in Egypt going with a bunch of Latinos to see the pyramid. Ah, Ivan, ahí están. No sé si se ve. Ooh, me beses. I'll get to it later, but I went to Egypt to learn Arabic and I ended up improving my Spanish. Now, how did I learn besides watching anime and practicing with people? Well, there's a new word, you write it down, you know what I'm saying? I had a, I like to make WhatsApp groups with friends that are native speakers and uh, when I learn a new word or phrase and I kind of record a voice message and then they write it back to me in Spanish and I can 
practice. The great thing about Spanish is, let's say you're interviewing somebody and you don't know how to ask the question, you can whip out Google Translate, bing, bang, bong, you write down what you want to say, you practice it once, you can, you can have a Bluetooth earphone in, and then just ask the question. And if you don't know it, cool, you'll learn eventually. If you don't even know what you're saying, that's okay. If you're making a video, for example, nobody cares and they won't even notice. Now, the next two languages that I speak are Portuguese and Russian. I would say that they're pretty much on the same level. I'll start with Portuguese because we're talking about living in Latin America. So I lived for a month and a half in Brazil and I was working in a hostel because I ran out of money. That's a story for a different video. But I was there for three weeks and uh, I had the opportunity to film a beautiful video with uh, this Jewish guy that lives in Latin America's biggest slum, favela, Rocinha it's called. Now at that point, I didn't know if I actually speak Portuguese or not. I kind of heard it all the time because I was in the hostel, even though there were lots of English speakers and stuff in the hostel where I was working in. But I was exposed to Portuguese. And then three weeks later, when I found myself actually making a video and having to speak Portuguese to people, it just happened. I just started talking and uh, it worked, you know. Obviously, I said some things which are incorrect. I was uh, speaking Portuñol, which is like Portuguese uh, mixed with Spanish. And uh, people understood me. And uh, obviously, like within the next couple of weeks that I was there, my Portuguese got to a pretty fluent level. After I worked in the hostel, I went to live in Favela Vigigal because the hostel was in Copacabana, the main tourist area. And I was sick and tired of hearing every day in the hostel about somebody getting robbed violently, getting their phone stolen or whatever. And I figured I can go live in the favela. Why? Because in the favela, you're not going to get robbed. In the favela, there are rules. The mafia poke, most of the favela. And now, if alguien peleando con otro, the mafia va a decidir. Que va a pasar con él. And if it's wrong, gain a massage. Yes, gain a massage. Or también. Yes. Yes. Depends. 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 Depends on the cosa. So basically a lot of the people from the favela come to Copacabana and rob people. They're living in extreme poverty. You can watch my videos from there and you will see. But that's what they do. And as I said, in the favela, there are rules. You cannot rob anyone in the favela. They will cut your arms off. It's controlled by the mafia. There's kids standing around with M16s shirtless. Kids, I don't know, teenagers. And if somebody is going to rob you, then they will get punished. So I went to live in the favela for a couple of weeks. And in the favela, nobody spoke English, not like in the hostel. So that's where my Portuguese really became fluent. And I love the language. I think it's beautiful. I love the way that Brazilians speak Portuguese. No offense, people from Portugal. But when you guys speak it, it sounds like some weird mix of Russian and Spanish. When Brazilians say, tudo bem, cara, then it's, uh, it, it sounds beautiful. And Brazilian music is amazing. I can, I'll link some, a playlist that I made on Spotify with Brazilian music. Let's talk a bit about music in general because it's a huge tool in learning languages. I knew the song, for example, a girl from, The Girl from Ipanema, Garota de Ipanema. And I love that song and I just listened to it maybe a hundred times. And then I wrote down all the lyrics and then I studied each individual word until I understood it. And then boom, you have a huge vocabulary. And uh, that's what I, I do that with songs all the time. About Spanish, in every country in Latin America, in Spain, I don't know, in Equatorial Guinea, they speak different dialects of Spanish. They have their own special words. They talk in different tones. Even inside countries, then they have different accents. In Bogota, you have the Rolo accent in Colombia. In Medellin, you have the Paisa accent. In Argentina, you have the Rio Platense accent. So basically, I had to pick an accent and uh, local slang. And I decided to go for the Argentinian one because Argentina is my favorite country in the world. I think there's no better place. If you're earning money from outside, that is. I made a documentary about the economy there. It's a shit show. Argentina has been through economic crisis after economic crisis in the past couple of decades. There are multiple... Entonces decidí hablar español como argentino. I know that I don't sound 100% Argentinian. But when people meet me, then they assume that I lived in Argentina or something, or they just think I'm Argentinian, which is cool. And also I lie to people in Palestine that I'm Argentinian for my own safety. And I know everything about the place. So if somebody 
starts asking questions, then I can tell them because I can tell them everything because I lived there for half a year. And I just fucking love Argentina. Vamos Messi. Davai pagavarima ruskam. I learned Russian as a teenager. When I was about 17, I started. I was inspired to learn Russian because I grew up in Naharia in a neighborhood where there were a lot of people whose parents came from the former Soviet Union, from Russia and Ukraine mostly, but also from Moldova and different parts of the uh, former USSR. And uh, I liked the culture and I wanted to travel Russia. I actually, when I was 17, I was supposed to buy to fly to St. Petersburg, but I didn't have a passport. I had to renew my passport and that got canceled. But I went later in life. Politics aside, I think traveling in the former Soviet Union, you can ask bold and bankrupt, is a, a hell of an experience. I think it's really worth it to learn the Russian language. You get access to, I don't know, 18 countries. You know, places like Kyrgyzstan, all of Russia, Ukraine, not so much now, but I think people still speak Russian there. And, they, and I don't think they'll be mad at you if, you if they hear you speaking Russian with a foreign accent and they understand that that's the language that you speak in a case in which they don't speak English. The first time that I went to Moscow, I loved it so much that I went back a week later and went also to St. Petersburg. I think Moscow is a lot cooler than St. Petersburg because it really has that Soviet vibe, whereas St. Petersburg was designed by European architects and it has more of a European feel. It doesn't feel quite Soviet. Now, Russian is a hard language to learn, to be fair. And I can't say that I speak it very correctly, but I get my point across. And once again, if I want to say something, if I want to ask a question while I'm in a Russian speaking country, I just look it up quickly on Google Translate, see how it's said correctly. And then I approach with that. And then I continue the conversation as I would with in grammatically incorrect Russian. This has been said before, but I don't think you need to learn Russian grammar. I mean, eventually you should, you should want to learn Russian grammar if you want to be able to, I don't know, read Tolstoy or whatever. I think you can speak Russian pretty well without understanding the cases because they're confusing as hell and I still don't know them. And you'll see me speaking Russian in my videos. It seems fluent, but it's incorrect. Let's talk about Arabic. Ironically, Arabic being such a similar language to Hebrew, it was the hardest language for me to learn. I'll talk about my whole journey of learning Arabic. When I was 12, then uh, I really enjoyed Arabic class in school and I wanted to learn it. So I, was, uh, I learned Fuscha, which is formal Arabic. And uh, I pretty much forgot what I learned. I learned how to read and write and I learned some words and stuff and some sentences, but yeah, it's gone now. <laughs> and then I attempted to learn Arabic again when I flew from Argentina to Egypt. Funny story, when I came from Argentina to Egypt, I had mate, which is Argentinian tea, in my suitcase. And uh, they thought it was weed and I was, well, there's a whole video telling that story. Here's a clip from it. Halfway through saying, it's because I'm from Israel, I started crying. I really started crying tears. I burst out. Now I went to Egypt and Egyptian Arabic is different. It's nothing like Palestinian Arabic. The guy that's filming can verify. Uh, <laughs> and they use completely different words like Isaiah, how are you, instead of Shuwadak, like they say here. So I think the 47 days that I lived in Cairo just kind of confused me, to be honest. And also, I made friends with uh, this brother and sister from Peru, and we almost kind of lived together. And this girl from Ecuador, and we, you know, We'll just hang out every day and speak Spanish. So I ended up improving my Spanish in Egypt, which kind of missed the point, but hey, I'm happy I speak better Spanish now. And uh, yeah, like I didn't speak Arabic when I left Egypt, only like a couple of phrases and everything. I mean, here are clips of me speaking Arabic in the past, in my first trip to Palestine, and you'll see how shit it is. Me, Saluki. Yes. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I just happened to know some as I said, when I'm actually filming, then my mind kind of is like on ultra focus mode and I can speak a bit better. So like I can remember some words that I learned and uh, I can kind of form a question. But as I was speaking Arabic until quite recently, today's the 7th of November, which is exactly 
a month after Hamas's massacre in uh, the south of Israel, in the Gaza envelope. And on the 7th of October, I said, okay, let's go make videos about what's happening. I, I made a video about, uh, I think a day or two later, about people that had to leave the Gaza envelope and you know, leave all their, their stuff and go to Tel Aviv or whatever. And then I said, yalla, let's go to Gaza Envelope and make some videos. So I tried to get permission from the Israeli police, from, I talked to different journalists that I know. I, I'm not gonna say any names, but basically they didn't wanna let me go to Gaza Envelope. So I was like, okay, let's go and make a film about what's happening in the West Bank, which we are gonna post next week, inshallah. Now I figured I gotta learn Arabic quick at least enough Arabic to be able to interview people. So I did just that. So when the war started, I started learning Arabic very aggressively. Uh, let me recommend you actually another way to learn these languages. There's a channel called on YouTube, I'll link it, called Easy Palestinian Arabic. I mean, they do easy every language. They do easy Spanish, easy French, easy this, that. But Easy Palestinian Arabic really helped me because they basically go around Palestine, interview people about random stuff like, I don't know, which food they like. And they put subtitles in Arabic text, Arabglish, which is English with, uh, which is writing Arabic in English words with numbers as well to, for the letters that are missing in the, uh, in the Latin alphabet. And then they put the translation in English. I don't know how I didn't mention them until now, but they do that with every language. The original text, how to pronounce it, and then the translation. And uh, it's incredible, like, it's such a good tool to learn a language. So I recommend them and I'll leave a link in the description. Now on the 13th of October, God sent me an angel, pretty much. I was with my friend Sahir. Which I like very much, with Arabs and Jews, and they fit down very close. Yeah, they are close, we are close. They are, yes, you are new. You seem very nice, but I'm I don't Christian, know. I'm Christian, he's Jewish, and we are living together, you know? So You're we are Jewish? close. Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, from, I'll send you, it's, the video is called Just Another Day in Water on Israel. Israel. And, I, and we went to Tel Aviv together to go hang out with my two roommates here in Haifa. They're actually, they're, they're adorable. I love them. They're uh, a lesbian couple. And <laughs> I'm not going to say their names, but... Uh, they, they actually made me a friendship bracelet and uh, I, I lost it when I jumped in a well in Palestine. Sorry, Liel. <laughs> uh, anyway, we went to go hang out with them and then he said, hey, uh, my friend has invited us over to go hang out in Yafo, in her house. And uh, so we went, all four of us, me and the, the two girls in Saher, to this girl's house who invited us, a friend of Saher. And when I met the girl that invited us to hang out in her house, I was like, damn. She was funny, she was hot, she was cute. And basically she's my girlfriend now. She's Palestinian, Israeli, Israeli Arab, 48 Arab. They have a million names, these people, but whatever you want to call it. <laughs> what do you call yourself, man? Arab, Palestinian, Israeli. Yeah, depends where you are, right? Anyway, the point is, she, she also happened to be a teacher, an Arabic teacher. And uh, that's how I got my Arabic to the level that it is now. You'll see in the full documentary from Palestine. I've been teaching her Spanish as well in exchange. And uh, now when I went back to renting a place in Israel after having lived in Argentina, then I purposely picked Masada. I have a video about that street, but it's a street where basically Jews and Arabs hang out together. And there's a lot of bars where everybody there basically speaks Arabic. I'm not gonna name their names, but you can write Masada on Google Maps and you can go. And I said, I wanna rent a place in Masada. So I'm not gonna tell you exactly where, but so I can learn Arabic. So I was thinking I can work in one of the bars. And uh, unfortunately those, just for fun, you know, just to make some money and learn Arabic. But unfortunately those bars are, there's like 10 people working and uh, they get two shifts, two shifts a week each and they don't need anyone. So basically they didn't need any staff in any of these bars. So I thought, what the hell am I gonna do now? Well, I said, okay, I'll just, instead of doing my work at home on my laptop, I'll bring my laptop every day to one of these Arab speaking bars and I'll just work there and uh, try and make friends, you know? I don't know, maybe with, maybe when I'm smoking a joint in between editing, then 
talk to people. And that's exactly what happened. That's how I met Saher. He was with a friend of ours from Ramallah, who's actually in jail right now. Long story short, he didn't know that. There, there are Palestinians, in case you didn't know, that have permits to live in Israel. It costs 2,500 shekels. And uh, when the war started and they took all of these permits and people had to go back to Palestine, he didn't know that and he was jailed. And we had to bail him out. But anyway, that's how I met Saher. And Saher was actually looking for an apartment. And then the next day, me, Saher, and the guy from Ramallah went to look for an apartment. We found one and we almost sealed the deal. But when they found out that uh, the guy from Ramallah doesn't have a blue ID card, basically like he's not Israeli, then they didn't let us take it. And that was pretty dumb. We could have just went with somebody else and put it in their name, but whatever. Point is, Sahar was looking for an apartment, obviously. And I told him to stay in my house. And uh, yeah, like we started living together. And uh, they're still like, we still are. And I was learning Arabic with him. Anyway, one day, six days after the war started, the two girls that I was living with and that Sahar was staying in the room, instead of them, we're leaving to Barcelona because of the war. Like they don't feel like being in Israel when it's getting bombed. They have a point. Now French and Italian, I understand. I can't say I'm fluent, but they're very easy to understand if you speak Spanish at a high level, especially if it's written or any other Latin language. Maybe Romanian not because it's uh, the most difficult Latin language. But when I went to Italy, I found myself being able to hold conversations. And when I went to Morocco, and once again, filming, I kind of had to speak French. Ce n'est pas un problème? Ah, c'est not problem. Okay, okay. It's going to take us with a car to buy some hash. <laughs> then you can see me speaking a broken French, you like a bit of French, you know, with the help of Google Translate and just some words that I remember from watching a show called 10%. Unbelievable. Welcome to Nightingale Heart. I hope you'll be very happy here. Thank you. This is what you look like. I plan to improve my French and Italian in the future, but it's actually the problem with French is that there's no cheap place in the world, except for Tunisia, where you can live and improve your French. Because if you haven't noticed, it's a theme that I like to go and live in places to improve the language, which I've learned. And I can't go to Tunisia, obviously, right now. So I would have to live in Paris, which is one of the most expensive cities in the world, because I need a place that has an accessible airport or, and the other cities in France like Nice are even more expensive. And then you have Switzerland or Quebec. So these places are all really expensive. So I don't know when I'll get the chance to really improve my French and be able to make videos in uh, Western Africa. West Africa is also an option, but it's very expensive to get there. So I can't be based in West Africa and go and film videos in Israel or Palestine and come back or whatever. And it's hard, hard to access, like there's not many flights or anything. So yeah, and it's also pretty expensive in Western Africa, surprisingly, because in Africa in general, Africa is very expensive to travel because many places are lacking infrastructure and you find yourself paying a lot of money for basic things like, I don't know, internet or a hotel. Point is, I can see myself learning French in the future when hopefully I'll be making more money from YouTube and be, be able to afford living in a place like Paris, despite the extreme cost of live, living. I know you're gonna say, but you live in Israel, but Haifa is not that expensive. My rent here is 1,500 shekels, and uh, you can eat out for five, $10, a good meal. So, I mean, it's expensive, obviously, but it's like, it's no Paris. Ora parliamo della bellissima lingua italiana. I was in Italy three weeks altogether, two weeks in Catania. I have this amazing friend, I love her, her name is Eliana. Benvenuti in Sicilia, ragazzi. With local girl. I'm the local girl. That I met in Egypt as well, in a hostel. And she was also part of the Spanish-speaking gang because she speaks Spanish too. But she hosted me in Catania for about a week and then I loved it so much that I stayed in an Airbnb. I met lots of students that study philosophy in the university. And uh, I would go to the university every day to, it's a beautiful university, and I went there every day with my laptop to do my work and to smoke weed with the philosophy students because they were awesome. <laughs> we had some really cool conversations. I had a chance to improve my Italian while I wasn't there because I really like Italian culture, Italian music. One of my favorite artists is Dan Andre. He's a pacifist. 
Here's a quote for him that I love and I feel kind of defines how I feel. Ci aveva il tuo stesso identico amore. Ma la divisa di un altro colore. I've talked about my love for Fabrizio De Andre in the past. So this is the last person I wanted to introduce you to. Fabrizio De Andre, my personal favorite poet of Italy, composed music, he wrote. And that's it.